old info tech. New info tech. That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Kia and Fujitsu have been sleeping together for months now. I mean, we all knew it, but Kia got pregnant and to avoid a scandal, they've had to come out in public today. The happy couple is of course proud to announce they're looking forward to the birth of some bold new tech right here and right here with broad applications to the law enforcement community worldwide. There's a tsunami of tech in police patrol vehicles and the vehicles themselves are increasingly data driven. But the basic problem is the cop tech doesn't talk to the car tech and vice versa. This makes turning a civilian car into a cop car an exercise in Dickensian modification. They're still screwing PCs and radar control boxes onto dashboards with self-tapping screws. It's expensive, inelegant and cumbersome. Fujitsu Australia hatched this bold plan to turn this situation around and get the cop tech talking to the car tech. Ian Hamer is the principal architect of Fujitsu Australia. So Ian, just broadly, tell me exactly what we're both sitting on. Yeah, so this is a co-creation between Fujitsu and Kia for the new version of an AI-based or digital police car. A digital police car, okay. I'm having difficulty wrapping my brain around that. So just give me the top three headline elements to mm. what a digital police car actually is. Yeah, so we're looking at all of the pre-existing technology police would currently use where nothing talks to anything. And what we're doing is integrating all of that technology into something that's simple and easy for them to use, but we're delivering it through the infotainment screen and making the vehicle safer, but also more intelligent. And you're essentially eliminating a lot of that stuff that we're used to seeing in police cars, like the two or three ruggedized PCs that are kind of bolted fairly inelegantly to the dash. And it must be a real bugbear for the cops having their workspace enclosed like that and also wearing the big fat tactical utility belt. It's got to be pretty cramped in there. You're exactly right. I mean, let's face it, car manufacturers spend millions of dollars to make these things safe. So what we want to do is take a police car, which is, you know, these guys are out there to make us safe. And we want to deliver them a vehicle that makes them safe. So remove all of that equipment and actually deliver it through the infotainment screen. But, put, but also not defeature the actual vehicle itself. So not give them less ability, but actually provide them more. Talk to me about these little black boxes that we're both wearing. Mm, yeah, so this is the um, body-worn video camera that uh, Fujitsu worked with our partner MDU to actually deploy about four years ago to New South Wales Police. So all the cops wear these while they're out on the street? 100%. OK, so basically I can film you, you can film me. The cops are acquiring, procuring evidence yep. all the time when they're out going about their duties. 100%. Keeps them honest, keeps yep. us honest and protects the officer as well. Yeah, sure. So we've actually seen a, a huge reduction in violence towards officers just by having the actual body cam on the actual officer. How much has that reduction been? We're hearing between 60 and 70% reduction, which is pretty huge. Well, I'm happy to live in a joint where the cops don't get injured 60% more often. 100%. It's perfect. So yeah. how much is one of these babies? Look, you're looking at about, uh, per camera, you're looking at less than $600. The cost of one injury had to pay for itself, wouldn't it? 100%. In the future, you're talking about the car actually being able to function as a silent sentry, if you like. It can do facial recognition. It can read all the number plates in a car park. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost Orwellian, but kind of in a good way. So. Mm. Exactly how advanced and how close, well, exactly how close are we to that technology? Yeah, look, facial recognition is being used globally today. You know, we do it as a company for several different people globally. You know, number plate recognition and things like that. Yeah, they are available today, but the biggest problem is making them small enough and refined enough to put into a mobile environment like this. So you don't need to have a massive data center providing that intelligence. 
So that's what we're working really hard on, is actually how to take what is today's technology and potentially tomorrow's, but miniaturising it to make it available to the officers in the street. So if I get this properly, at the moment your average highway patrol car has a whole bunch of stuff bolted onto the outside that comprises the totality of the cops. Uh, information on the way in, if you like, and their ability to turn on the lights and sirens and do whatever else cops do in the course yep. of their normal business. What you're talking about here is actually integrating that into the CAN bus of the car and turning this into a sort of more holistic police car. So what, difference does, what differences does it make when you can tap into the CAN bus? Talk me through that. Yeah, no, it's a good question. So the beauty of having CAN bus integration is the officers instead of having to think about every action that they're doing to operate the car, we can actually have the car with some behavioural sciences actually react to what the officer's doing. So in the event of a number plate recognition hit um, where they need to go and chase that person down, if they then do fast acceleration, a hard U-turn, the vehicle can pick that up and we can then activate lights and sirens and do all of those functional things on their behalf to allow them to focus on driving safely and doing their job. So you've got a palm print scanner in there, mm -hmm. right? So it's biometric. The cops no longer have to type in their 27,000 digit encrypted password to get into the bad guy database. Mm. They just go and they're logged in, yep. right? Exactly how foolproof is that? How does it work? And where's the, where's the data on the approved handprints? Is it in the car or is it in the cloud or what? Yeah, good. So with the actual palm scanner itself, what it does, it actually shoots infrared into your palm. Now it actually reads your palm structure. Um, and uses that as a digital or biometric fingerprint. We're talking about the blood vessels in your hand? 100%. Okay. So if you lose your hand, no blood vessels, no login. I've You're never done. lost my hand. Never lost your hand? Yeah. yeah it's a terrible thing to happen. Um, so what we're actually looking at doing is storing that information actually in the police data centre. So effectively what that allows them to do is any key or stinger they get into in the fleet, even if they've never been into it, they can log straight into all of their applications. And the bad guys don't get access to those critical can't systems? Get it maintains their chain of command, it's, di it's biometrically locking all of their actions. And the beauty of it, it's encrypted not just in the scanner, but it's secondary encryption across the wire. So it's totally unbreakable. And you've even put the radar detection into the car's original equipment head-up display. Correct. Correct. How does that work? Yeah, so with a radar, the officer needs to basically watch a screen to work out uh, if the target car they're looking at has broken the law. And they can't watch a screen while they're driving, so they have to listen to a tone. So what we thought is, instead of having to listen to quite an irritating tone, um, by integrating the output of that radar into the head-up display, it's exactly where the officer's eyes should be, and that's facing forward on the road, doing their job. So that way, when they have a hit, we can get rid of more equipment off the dashboard and just use Kia's existing head-up display to display that information they need to see. How easy was it to integrate this stuff into an original equipment car? Because I know you had a few hurdles with other car makers. Why are we doing it with a Kia? Yeah, so look, I'll be honest with you. Kia was the manufacturer that, when we talked to, after we did talk to pretty much everyone else, they understood what we were trying to create. And they truly believed in the benefits that this would actually provide to their customers as well, the police. So they've engaged with us providing us a lot of not just a vehicle of course which is mandatory to develop on but a lot Hard of engineering. Hard to do it without the vehicle. Well yeah there's not many head-up displays on a uh, on a kitchen sink for instance you know it just doesn't exist. So you know without them and their engineering support because they're the car people, fidgets who aren't. Without them providing that information that intelligence and obviously the system we couldn't actually integrate with it. Now, one more question for you. This has got broad, worldwide applications, right? Because mm. it's not just the cops. We're talking about the ambos and the fireys, mm. and there's civilian applications as well, I guess. 100%. But I understand you've had a covert sort of conversation with the men in black. What was it like talking to Tommy Lee Jones about <laughs> this? <laughs> there was a blue flash light, and I can't remember a lot of it. Right. But, um, and there were a few that beeps. A lot. Oh, it does, and mm. the beeps in the background, not sure. But um, look, it was interesting because, you know... This is the Department of Homeland Security, by the way. So this is a serious inquiry from the heaviest of heavy hitters when it comes to law enforcement, just in case you were wondering. And look, it was funny because we all think that, you know, in Australia, we're a little bit behind the eight ball in some areas. You know, we like to think we're not, but unfortunately some people still do. And US have it all in spades. But in all honesty, they were quite surprised about what we'd actually managed to achieve with the Kia. In fact, 
we're so far ahead of what they've already done, they, they don't understand how we've actually got to where we've got to already. So they're actually asking us for you know, advice and guidance and assistance on how they can join our program. Australian ingenuity, mate. I'm looking forward to my long-term test Stinger cop car. Thanks very much. Mate, appreciate your time. Imagine if car makers opened the door in this way to aftermarket modification. Do you want to ditch that expensive key and have secure biometric access to your car? Maybe add a surround camera system and just drag and drop a control app straight onto the infotainment screen. How about fitting and customising the information on a brand new head-up display? Personally, I want some of this stuff in my next car. You know, I want to walk up to the car and just put my friggin' hand on it and have the car go, ah yes, I know you. Here's your Sport Plus mode setting. Here's the ambient lighting you want. Seats in the right place. Just get in and I'm cranking up ACDC's Highway to Hell just for you. Thanks a lot for coming. I'm not expecting that anytime soon, but I do think this whole infotainment thing is a real battleground for car makers because look around the industry, most of them are so emphatically crap at it, and yet Apple and Google tend to be pretty good. I want some of this tech in my car, not necessarily the law enforcement stuff. How about you? What do you think, you know? Are you still mourning the death of the cassette player or even the CD player more recently expired. Requiescat in pace, I say to both of them, but frankly, I don't miss them that much. Let me know what your big infotainment bugbear is in the comments feed below. And thanks for watching.